In order for the evolutionary paradigm to be able to explain the history of life on Earth, the fossil record needs to look a certain way. The fossil record needs to display uh, gradual evolutionary transformations where one major group is transitioning to another major group and that these transitions need to be characterized by numerous transitional intermediate forms. These are features that flow from the evolutionary paradigm. These represent predictions, if you will, for evolution to be valid. Yet when we look at the fossil record, we see that instead of seeing gradual evolutionary change, we see sudden appearance of new forms, new major groups, followed by vast periods of time where those groups are unchanged. That is, they remain static or they display stasis. We also see a near absence of transitional intermediates in the fossil record as well. These two features run counter to the predictions and the expectations of the evolutionary model. And Charles Darwin, when he wrote his book on the origin of species, lamented the fact that the fossil record did not display transitional forms. And in fact, even today, 150 years later, we still see a fossil record that lacks, for all intents and purposes, transitional intermediates. For example, the late paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould said all paleontologists know that the fossil record contains precious little in the way of intermediate forms. Transitions between major groups are characteristically abrupt. Yet evolutionary biologists, in spite of these general features with regard to the fossil record, are still convinced that evolution can account for life's history and the diversity of life that we see today. And they point to a few instances of what appear to be transitional forms to justify, to validate their expectation that life's history can be explained by biological evolution. And one of these classic transitional forms that scientists like to point to is Archaeopteryx, which appears about 155 million years ago in the fossil record. And many people argue that Archaeopteryx appears to be a midpoint between reptiles and birds. This is the common understanding that people have of Archaeopteryx, yet the fact of the matter is Archaeopteryx is, is a true bird. It's an ancient bird. It belongs to a group known as the Archaeornithines, but nevertheless it is a true bird. And it appears quite suddenly in the fossil record without any true transitional form leading up to it. Now for many years scientists thought that the way to explain the origin of birds is that they evolved from a reptile known as a thecodont. Uh, that the idea here is that these types of ancient reptiles gave rise to birds. But the problem is there's a hundred million year gap between thecodont appearance in the fossil record and when Archaeopteryx appears and there are no transitional forms connecting this ancient reptile to the very first birds. Moreover, thecodonts and birds really lack similar characteristics to each other. Again, undermining the idea that there's an evolutionary connection between these reptiles and birds. In more recent years, scientists have argued that the transitional form that produced birds would be feathered dinosaurs that belong to a group known as the theropods. These would be dinosaurs that walk around on two legs, that is, they would be bipedal dinosaurs uh, that look like the raptors that people are familiar with in Jurassic Park. And the argument goes something like this. The theropod dinosaurs have a number of shared anatomical characteristics with birds. Some of them appear to, to possess feathers. They have other features of their anatomy that connects them to birds. And they even nest, laying eggs and produce nests similar to what birds would do. And so the argument is that these theropod dinosaurs evolved to give rise to birds. Now, in, to justify uh, this model, there needs to be, again, transitional forms in the fossil record that, again, connect theropod dinosaurs to birds to Archaeopteryx, which again appears at 155 million years ago in the fossil record. And in recent years, scientists have discovered a number of sites where there are feathered dinosaurs, what appear to be feathered dinosaurs, feathered theropods in the fossil record. One site is in China that dates at about 125 million years ago that has yielded a number of very interesting feathered dinosaurs. And people argue that these feathered dinosaurs represent the transitional forms that document this transition from, again, a theropod dinosaur to the very first bird, Archaeopteryx. The problem with this explanation, however, 
is something known as the temporal paradox, in which you have transitional forms appearing in the fossil record after the forms that they are supposed to have evolved into. Also, some people have questioned whether or not the feathers associated with these feathered dinosaurs are actually true feathers. Some people have argued they may be artifacts of the preservation process that the fossils underwent from the time that the organism died to the time that paleontologists recover those fossils in the geological column. And the argument is that, that these are not true feathers, but actually may be frayed skin, frayed integument. Some people have argued that what are being interpreted as uh, feathered theropods are actually flightless birds. Uh, Caudipteryx is one example that was originally interpreted as a theropod is now understood to be a flightless bird. The whole point here is that while this idea of birds evolving from theropods is rather intriguing, and it's true you can point to what appear to be perhaps feathered theropods in the fossil record, these all appear after, again, the first true bird Archaeopteryx appears. And then finally, uh, there are other features of bird anatomy and theropod dinosaur anatomy that don't quite connect and don't quite uh, support this evolutionary transition. One has to do with the structure of the foot. The, the structure of the bird foot is fundamentally different than the structure of the theropod foot, though superficially they look the same. The forelimbs in birds are much longer, in theropods they're much shorter, and then birds have a unique lung structure that is not found in anything else on the planet. And so when you look at these features, this also begins to weaken that link between theropods in birds. Now how do you explain then these feathered dinosaurs that exist in the fossil record and their superficial similarity to birds? Well, it could very well be that again these are feathered dinosaurs and that these feathers play an important role in the dinosaur biology. Maybe these serve as a form of insulation or help to stabilize these, these bipedal dinosaurs when they move around, providing some kind of aerodynamic support, helping them to balance while they're running at very fast speeds. So there's a number of possible reasons why these dinosaurs may have feathers that would reflect design, if you will, not necessarily an evolutionary connection. In fact, you could argue that if the dinosaurs and the birds are produced by a creator, you'd expect that creator to use similar designs in organisms that have similar anatomical and physiological requirements. And so you can account for these feathered dinosaurs as part of a creation model paradigm. Something else that I believe is troubling when it comes to bird origins that undermines the evolutionary paradigm and I think at the same time supports a creation model view of the fossil record is the fact that, again, whenever we see the appearance of birds, they appear explosively. These are called radiation events by paleontologists. Archaeopteryx, as we said, shows up at about 155 million years ago virtually out of nowhere. Uh, in the, there is something shortly after uh, Archaeopteryx appears that is known as the Cretaceous radiation where you have an explosive diversification of different bird forms that appear in the fossil record. There's another radiation that happens somewhere between 90 and 75 million years ago where again we see an explosive diversification of new bird forms and then finally after dinosaurs go extinct at the KT extinction event about 65 million years ago, we see another radiation where modern birds appear for the very first time. These are called the Neoornithines. And what you see here when we look at the natural history of birds is that the very first birds appear without any transitional intermediates leading up to them. They appear suddenly and we see three radiation events in the natural history of birds where these are episodes of explosive diversification. This doesn't fit the, the evolutionary expectations of what the fossil record should look like, but fits perfectly a creation model paradigm where we would see a creator being involved in life's history and orchestrating life's history for his purposes and if that's the case then we'd expect, expect explosive appearances, sudden appearances, explosive diversification. So when we look at the fossil record with respect to the natural history of birds it doesn't look like we should expect it to look if indeed evolution accounts for the history of life on earth. And in this case, the, the origin of birds and the natural history of birds. 
Instead of seeing a gradual emergence of the very first birds with well-documented transitional forms, we see the sudden appearance of the very first bird, Archaeopteryx. And following that, we don't see gradual evolutionary transformation and diversification of those ancient birds into more modern birds, but rather we see stasis followed by explosive radiation events in three separate instances. The last one being at 60 million years ago with the introduction of modern birds on the surface of the Earth. This doesn't look like, again, you'd expect things to look if indeed evolution explains the history of life on Earth. This is exactly what you expect the fossil record to look like if a creator is responsible for orchestrating life's history for his purposes. Sudden appearances of new forms without any transitional intermediates leading up to that first true form. Radiation events where there's explosive diversifications. This would, I think, reflect the involvement of a creator bringing about, again, diversification of birds at different times in Earth's history. The fossil record looks exactly what, like we would expect it to look if a creator is responsible, again, for the history of life and the diversity of life on Earth. And the features of the fossil record fail to meet the predictions based on the mechanism of biological evolution.